Good morning, Inga Church, and welcome. If you could please read out loud with us, we are going to read Psalms 34 and prepare our hearts for worship. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Will you stand as we worship together?
There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe. All right, let's sing it out when we fight. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I'll lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night. Oh. are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible. somebody nearby. So good to worship with you all today.
Amen. Amen. Wow. Let's give another hand. That was amazing. I can think of no better way to respond to a baptism like that than just to, to stand up and continue to praise our, our Heavenly Father who saves these children, who loves them, and just to pray that the Lord would continue to be magnified in our lives.
our daily lives. May we reflect your glory. May we reflect who you are. Lord, you are changing lives. You are changing lives in this room. Thank you for the testimony of those two young girls who showed that they believe in you, Jesus, and they want their life to reflect your glory. God, may that be the cry of our hearts as we go about, talk to people, interact with this world of darkness. God, may we be light. May we shine your glory into this world that desperately needs the hope of Jesus. May we magnify your name always. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. Well, we were blessed to have members of our student worship team leading us this morning. Let's give them a round of applause. Welcome to all of you who are here in person and those of you who are joining us online. We are glad that you're at Anchor. If you're a guest with us today, stop by the welcome table in the lobby. We have a gift for you as our way of saying welcome to Anchor Church, and we'd love to hear how you found out about us. And if you're looking for a church to call home, next week during the first service, we have a class called, um, it's called Step 2. We keep it kind of simple. You could come to Step 1, 2, and 3. And if you're looking for a church, come to step two. It's two Sundays in a row. We'd love for you to learn more about Anchor Church and how you can get plugged in. Um, okay, so each week we have cards in the chair backs in front of you. And we just want to periodically let you know that if you have a care request, a way that we can help you, if you have a prayer request, a way that we can pray for you, or uh, a God at work story, you can fill those out and you can drop them in the offering plate, and we'll pray for you, we'll follow up if there's a way we can care for you, and we love to hear God at work stories, so let us know. Uh, Those are always in the chair backs in front of you, and you can fill one of those out. Any week, you have something to share uh, with us. Now, we had two people get baptized this morning, two priceless little girls, and tonight we have uh, like 11 teenagers getting baptized at student ministry. Isn't that thrilling? (laughs) Praise God for what he's doing in their hearts. You're welcome to come tonight if you'd like, six o'clock, and uh, of course family and friends of those getting baptized are invited. Uh, But what makes heaven happier? Wow, when one sinner repents, somehow there's rejoicing in heaven, and so we're thrilled that God's really at work in the hearts of our young people. If you are interested in learning about spiritual leadership, we have a class after the second service today called Welcome to Leadership. You can go through our leadership development steps. It doesn't mean we're going to put you in charge of something, okay? It's not like you show up and suddenly you're in charge of a ministry, right? But anyone who wants to learn about spiritual leadership, you're invited. We got a great lunch, and it's after second service today, so come back if you'd like. We'd love for you to register online or on the app so we know you're coming, Uh, but you don't have to. You can just show up. It's after second service today. We're going to collect our offering this morning, and there are several ways you can give. We'll put them up on the screen. We would love for you to uh, give generously to the Lord. I think, do we have that giving slide we could put up there, Josh? Maybe we don't have it. Well, you can give through the app, you can give online, you can give in person, or you can even snail mail it in if you would like. But we would love to pray for this morning's offering together. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful that you have been transforming lives, saving souls, and Lord, we rejoice with the angels above. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the Savior King who reaches down into our dark world, pulls people up out of lostness and depravity, makes them a new creation, and then you alone prepare a place for them in heaven. Thank you for those who are getting baptized this morning and tonight. We just pray that you would fill them with a spirit of peace and joy and courage to go and tell everyone that you are alive. We pray that you would bless our offerings, O Lord, and bless those who give as you have promised to in your word. We pray that you would meet all of their needs according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's time to check into church. If you're seated at the left end of your row, grab the guest book, fill it out, pass it down the road. There's a QR code on the front of the bulletin you can use to check in too, but you still have to pass the book right now. It's Pastor Appreciation Month. Have you encouraged your pastors? Drop a card or a note of encouragement in the box in the back of the worship center. Are you looking for a church to call home? Or have you been at Anchor for a while and are wondering what the next step is? Come and join us for step two, October 22nd and 29th during the nine o'clock service. We'd love to help you understand more about who we are as a church 
and how we can help you grow in your walk with Christ. Sign up online and we hope to see you there. All right, we didn't know if we were going to have time for this, but we do. So um, we're going to show you one more video from our new website we launched, and it's called findgodagain.com. We would love for you to head to that website today and hear stories of lives changed uh, in our congregation. So go ahead, play that video uh, of the testimony, keeps Dave's on testimony. Pursuing me, keeps on going after me, and when I stop running, um, that's when he um, is able to just restore me and release the anger and the bitterness um, and just all the hurt that I had um, buried deep in my heart. And he can do that for you too. So I, I grew up in the church uh, and I was fortunate enough to be able to do that considering my, um, my parents are immigrants from Vietnam and so um, I'm thankful that I was able to just know and learn about Jesus at a very young age. But it wasn't until I kind of grew up a little bit more, and uh, up until about my senior year of high school, you know, I was doing life of just basically trying to do as many of the do's on the do list and staying away from all the don'ts on the don't list. Um, and I was largely unsuccessful in doing that. And it just was just a, a matter of just doing things to try to be a good Christian. And it wasn't until my senior year that I really learned what it was to be a Christian. It's just to, to have a relationship um, with Jesus and not trying to to earn His love because uh, He gives He gives it to me freely already. And this continued, thankfully, uh, into my adult years. I grew in my knowledge of Him and just in my walk with Him. And I continued into my adult years until I met my wife, uh, who I met at a, a house church with my friend who started it. Um, we fell in love, we got married, and then about a year into our marriage, we decided to visit Taiwan because that's where her parents uh, were serving as missionaries at a church. Uh, less than a year later, we felt called to move to Taiwan, so we decided we're gonna pack our bags, we're gonna go and move to Taiwan, we're gonna help um, their church plant and just be missionaries with them out there. But just before we we left, um, we found out that my wife was expecting our first child. Uh, so we were super excited, of course. Uh, but then only a few weeks later, uh, through different doctor's tests, we found out that um, she was probably going to have a pretty rare genetic disease, which wasn't going to give her um, a really good survival rate. Um, so we were kind of um, saddened by this and a little stressed and just trying to figure out what do we do and we came to, to the decision that we're just gonna go I mean this this wasn't a surprise to God God knew this was coming and we had already made that commitment to move out there so we decided let's just do it so in January of 2013 we packed up our bags sold most of our stuff and uh, and moved out to Taiwan to the other side of the world and shortly thereafter um, uh, my wife gave birth to our first daughter Sophia and um, despite all of the predictions that the doctors said about her not making it to full term, not being born alive, not being able to live even a week, she defied all those odds and she lived um, miraculously 47 days. Um, but then she did pass. Needless to say, that broke me. Um, I didn't know what to do with that. Um, I didn't know how to make sense of like being called to a foreign country, to do what we thought was God's work, only to have our first daughter uh, die. While my wife found comfort in, in the Lord, and she um, found comfort in uh, the community of the church, I just grew cold and bitter and angry. Um, and that carried on for a number of years. And that was 2013. Fast forward to 2022, this has been nine years of just harboring all this anger and all this bitterness. And in that process, kind of just building up these habits of protecting my time, protecting the things that I have, the material things of this world, and then kind of just pursuing those things, you know? And I still tried to do like the Christian thing of trying to, you know, go to church and trying to read my Bible sometimes, but it just wasn't really jiving. And, and I was trying to check all the boxes, you know, um, to do all the right Christian things, but nothing was working. And it wasn't until um, I heard a message from Pastor Bob here 
that really just struck my heart like only the Holy Spirit could do. And I could just feel that God was telling me like, I don't need you to do more. I don't need you to work harder. Um, I just want you. And um, he just wanted my time. And so I thought to myself, well, how am I gonna get that time? I got, I got a full-time job, I've got a wife, three kids, I got all my interests that I, that I want to do and accomplish in life, like where am I going to find this time? And I just felt him saying, just, just give me a try, just give me a try. So I don't know what it was um, other than the Holy Spirit prompting me, but the next morning I just decided, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a try. And I spent time with the Lord. I, I read my Bible and I prayed. and. He was just so faithful. In those coming weeks, he changed my heart in a way that I could not have imagined and did things to heal my heart from all the brokenness and all the anger and all the bitterness that I had harbored and held on so tightly to. He healed me and allowed me to just let those things go and find peace and joy in him that I could not have found in all the things that I was chasing. He multiplied the time that I had given him somehow and was still able to do all these different things. And I just got so much more meaning out of each day as he gave it to me. In Jeremiah 29, uh, 13, it says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And you know, I'm not perfect. I don't, I don't seek him perfectly, but I, I gave him a chance and he was, he was faithful and he delivered uh, more than I could have imagined. God has pursued me through all of my ups and downs. And even when I didn't know he was there, I could now look back and see how his hand was on everything. And, um, you know, only he could have done what he did in my life to just like awaken me and give me a new perspective. He refreshed me and gave me a new lease on life. And, um, you know, I think that just all the things that I went through, um, and what he's done in my life just proves how faithful he is, even when I'm not. Um, so I'm just so thankful for that, and that's, that's my story. We're so grateful for those who have already filmed their stories, and we would love for you to have the courage to share your story as well. So let Pastor Stephen know if you would like to have your story on that website. All right, we're going to go to Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. And I want to start by teaching you a new word as we get into the sermon today. Um, I'll say it, and then you can say it with me, okay? Are you ready? New word? All right, here it is. Uh, it is para decatrophobia. Go ahead. Well done! <laughs> it's the fear of Friday the 13th. It was Friday the 13th on Friday. And people are afraid of Friday the 13th. They're afraid of the number 13. And you may be surprised to know that the uh, phobia about the number 13 and Friday the 13th stretches back. Like, like some, they don't know exactly when it started, but it could go all the way back to like 1700 BC. There seemed to be some stigma attached to the number 13. And in the 1800s, there was a group of guys who formed the 13 Club to try and prove to everyone that there was nothing unlucky about the number 13. So they met once a month on the 13th in a group of 13 in room number 13, and they did unlucky things like breaking mirrors and walking under ladders and <gasps> opening umbrellas indoors. None of them died. But people don't care. They were still afraid of the number 13 and Friday the 13th. Are we still afraid of that today? Absolutely. Do you know the number is so feared that many hospitals and airports avoid using 13 for rooms, gates, Couples don't get married on the 13th of the month. According to Otis Elevator Company, around 85% of elevator panels don't have the number 13, which means there's no 13th floor in these buildings. Well, there is. They just don't call it that. Well, when it comes to things we should be afraid of, things that make us watch out, Friday the 13th is one of them, but we really shouldn't be afraid of that. Today's sermon 
is all about something that we should be afraid of, something that we should beware of, something we should watch out for. So turn to the person next to you and say, watch out. The whole sermon is that. Watch out. Not for black cats. Worse. Let's pray. Father, we pray today that you would help us to heed the warning of this passage. Show us what we should be afraid of. Show us what we should beware of. And as we heed this warning, we pray that you would bless our faith as we seek to walk with you and build a congregation together that is holy and healthy and humble. We pray this in your name. Amen. So the Apostle Paul started last week telling the elders from Ephesus his final exhortations. We're on the third missionary journey. He is headed home after three years on the field. His third missionary journey will then lead to uh, a time of imprisonment. He knows it's coming. God's getting him ready for that. So as he wraps up this three-year missionary effort all over many regions and many cities, he grabs the elders from Ephesus, the base of this missionary journey, and he gives them a final exhortation. He doesn't think he's ever going to see them again. What would you say if you grabbed the people you love most and you said, look, I don't think you're ever going to see me again, so listen. That's the tone and the tenor of what's happening. And he has elders, he has leaders from this church. He knows they're going back to strengthen and develop all of these congregations. So that's the background of this passage. And this is part two. So you can catch part one uh, online from last week. But check out verse 28 as he continues his exhortation. He says, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. From among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day, to admonish everyone with tears. Okay, let's take that first. Our first couple points will come from that. Number one, write this down. Watch out. And you, you might want to write it in all caps. It is a strong exhortation to watch out. He says in chapter 20, verse 28, watch out. Pay careful attention is the way it's phrased in verse 28. And in verse 31, he says, be alert. And behind these words is the sense of stay awake, pay attention, look around, with the expectation that something perilous is bound to happen. Be on guard. Watch out. So we are to see the danger and take evasive action knowing it's coming. Now, we have a golden doodle, Cosmo, and he is the gentlest creature alive. But Halloween freaks him out, all right? When we take him for a walk around the neighborhood, he sees all the inflatable ghosts and witches, and he is on high alert. What does he do, given all of the danger around us? He looks, he, he flinches, he barks, and then he hides right behind our legs. Some dog he is, but he senses the danger, he sees it, and he takes evasive action. Now, when it comes to what we're being warned of here, it's far worse than inflatable witches. We are to watch out for several things. Write this down, watch yourself. Watch yourself. Watch out, watch out, watch out for what? Everyone go like this, hold up one finger, hold up one finger and go like this. Are you watching out for what can happen here? The leaders were all around him. And he's, he says, look, the watch, the lookout starts with you as you watch yourself and each other. Watch out. 
Watch each other. Watch yourself. Elders, leaders, are a primary target of the enemy. And Satan will target leaders in a church, their beliefs and their behaviors. If he can get them off, he can cause tremendous damage in the church. If he can't get them off, then he can bring people in to accuse them, ruin their reputation, and that also can create damage in the church. So we are simultaneously told to watch out so that we don't give the enemy anything to work with and so that we don't give the enemies of God anything to use to break up the church. Watch yourself. Paul's modeling this for us because he had a lot of enemies in the surrounding area and he's showing the importance of having a reputation of integrity and then watching out for not being misled or disqualified in the faith. So we must be on guard. That's why he says to watch yourself first. He says, pay careful attention, verse 28, to yourselves. He echoes this in other passages. In 1 Timothy 4.16, and we'll put this up on the screen, 1 Corinthians 9.27. He says, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching doctrine. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Paul didn't have this haughty heart of like, well, I'm already a grace graduate. Look after me. What's the point? I am complete. I'm watching you. No, the watch started over his own life and doctrine. So watch yourself. When spiritual leaders in a church fail, that often creates the hardest pain a church can endure. When elders and pastors fail, that creates tremendous anguish and agony. The elders here, it means pastors, elders, overseers. They're used interchangeably. So at our church, our history, we've had 13, over our 14-year history, 13 pastors or elders who've served on staff or on the board. We've had three of them disqualify themselves. And the damage that they did to the church is indescribable. But those who watch out, those who bring incredible strength to the church create much joy in heaven and on earth because they serve well and they don't fall. So watch yourself. And then write this down, watch your flock. Watch your flock. It says here to pay careful attention, verse 28, to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. So we are to watch the flock. The flock stands for Christians, so even though I am a pastor, elder, overseer, right, I'm also a sheep. I'm a sheep of God. And so when the Bible says flock, sheep, it refers to all Christians. But those who are given leadership roles are meant to assume a role of shepherding over other sheep, to care for them, to watch over them, to direct them, to protect them. So we are to watch the flock, the people of God. We have to watch them with the staff and the rod because they are prey to the enemy and to false teachers. That's why we have to pay careful attention to the flock. Watch yourself. Watch your flock. When it says be alert later, pay careful attention here, one nuance is to stay awake. You're watching, you're awake, you're alert. So you're on guard. If a shepherd fell asleep out in the field and the wolf came, the sheep would have no chance against the wolf. So you have to guard yourself. I've got a picture here of two types of guards, right? On the left, you have a security guard. Do you see him? Did you see him on the left? He set up a poster of a guard with a shotgun but then he's sleeping behind that poster. (laughs) And on the right, you have the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, always guarded all year long, rain, shine, sleet, hail, snow, doesn't matter. The guard is posted right now. What kind of a 
watch do you have on your flock? If you're a leader, if you're a small group leader or a ministry leader or an elder, a deacon, how is your level of alertness over the sheep that you know? Are you fast asleep on the job, uncaring or uninformed, or are you on high alert watching over those who God has entrusted to you? How is your level of alertness? Watch your flock. Watch out. Watch yourself. Watch your flock. Now, everybody say, why? why? No, like, say it loudly. Like, Sometimes the Bible tells us how to do something, and sometimes the Bible tells us why to do something. We're going to get some whys here. So number two, write this down. Watch out, because God made you overseers of his people. Because God made you overseers of his people. That's the second point Paul makes here. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock, here it is, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. There's a Trinitarian description here of God. And remember, we don't just believe in any old God or every God out there. We believe in the one true God who exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is the only true God. And so God, that God, made you overseers of his people. So we have to think biblically about God to understand the church and spiritual leadership. These things are converging here. Write this down. What is the church? What is the church? When the word is used here of the church, uh, the word is ekklesia in the Greek, and the word means a people who are called out. A called out people. Spiritually, it means we have been called out of darkness and sin and death to become a people of God. We are therefore called out of the world to be the people of God. This passage specifically calls leaders to watch over the church. Those who have been called out. When you think of church, what comes to mind? I don't know your upbringing. Maybe when you think of church, what comes to mind is boring. Oh my goodness, I had to go every week growing up. Sit, stand, kneel. I hated it. Maybe you liked church growing up. Maybe you went to a kid's club like Awana or uh, something else like that in a different denomination. And you got your sash and you got your badges and you got your sugar And you went home screaming because you were so excited. Maybe you got a positive experience or maybe you have a negative experience. But often when people think of the church, they think of the building or they think of the denomination, the externals or the baggage they have. But they don't actually think of what the church is spiritually. What is the church? This could help a lot of people who have problems with the church. Because I think you're only thinking of the externals, not the beautiful, magnificent, spiritual creation of God. So what is the church? Well, looking at the Trinitarian parts of this, it says here in verse 28, it's the church of God. So God the Father is represented here. And it says, the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. So the Holy Spirit is mentioned there. And then it says, which he obtained with his own blood, which is for Jesus Christ, his death. The blood here stands for the entirety of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Father, Son, and Spirit are all mentioned here, and the church is defined in relationship to God. Listen, the church is defined as a special group of people rightly related to God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the church. Write this down. We are God's people. The church is God's people. That represents the Father. We are His. The Father adopted us into His family through faith in the Son. Nobody is born a child of God. We must be adopted into the family through faith. Then we become God's people, children of God. Here is a picture of a family that broke the record for largest family photo ever taken in China. 
Record break. You can't even see. There's like over 500 people from this one family that gathered together to take a family picture. They had to go out like to a outdoor cavernous area on a mountain to get the family in the picture. And you can't even see all of them. There's another aerial photo that shows all of them. Family photo. So the idea of a gigantic family is what the church is. We are the family, the household of God. We are the family. We are God's people. Write this down. We are God's presence. We are God's presence. This reflects the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes to live in you through faith in Jesus Christ, He also unites you to every other believer who's ever lived. We are spiritually one, and therefore, and 1 Corinthians really expands on all this, but the Holy Spirit doesn't just take up residency in you individually. The Spirit is present in the church corporately. Therefore, Christ is in us individually and in us as the gathered community of God in a special way. We are the dwelling place of God. Christ took on flesh in Bethlehem, died on the cross, rose again, and he's taken on flesh again in you, if you believe in him, and in us as the church. We are his body, the presence of God, and that happens because his spirit is in us. That makes us temples of God. We are God's presence. Here's a picture of the temple in Jerusalem that temporarily held the presence of God, but if you read Ezekiel, later chapters, the presence of God left the temple because of the unfaithfulness of God's people. That glory returned to Jerusalem in the person of Jesus Christ. And then at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell upon the church of God. We are now the glorious temple of the living God. That is the church. So we are God's people. We are God's presence. And write this down. We are God's purchase. We are God's purchase. It says, the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. What Your translation may say there, the blood of the Lord or the blood of the Lamb. Sometimes a translation will supply a word that's not in the original Greek to clarify the meaning. The reason they would do that is because it sounds a little confusing here, because it says the church of God, that's the Father, which he obtained with his own blood, there's a heresy alert here, heresy alert. The Father did not die on the cross for us. Okay, that's called modalism, where you think the Father is the Son and the Son is the Spirit. That's a heresy. So it could sound like it's God the Father's blood, but it really is just a literary device here. It's the Father who sent His Son, His own blood, right? That's Jesus dying on the cross. It's very clear, and so... It's not wrong for translations to help clear that up because they're indicating a right truth. But if your translation doesn't say that, you just need to know that his own blood means his own son in this text. Therefore, we are God's purchase through his son. Here's a picture of the cross and the tomb. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He lived the perfect life. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin, all of your sin. He took your record of debt and nailed it to the cross, taking it away. If you believe that you needed Jesus to die on the cross, to take away your sin, he was thrown in the tomb, and on the third day he was raised to new life. He now rules heaven. If you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you and rose again and rules heaven, you are saved. You become the purchase of God. And you must be purchased because the corresponding, what does it mean to be human? The corresponding reality of what it means to be human is you are a slave to sin. You are enslaved in sin, and he must buy you out, redeem you out, purchase you out of that with the payment of his son. Then, and then alone can you say, I am free indeed. Hey, that's the church. Why should I watch out? Because God made me over, an overseer of his People, his people, his presence, his purchase. When you see who the church is, this reality 
will drive you to watch over God's people and presence and purchase with great care and affection because of who we are. We're the church. Watch out because God made you overseers of his people. So write this down. Well, then who are the leaders? Who are the leaders? So there are three words used for elders, pastors, and overseers. Elders, shepherds, overseers here. And these words are important. We see them in the text in verse 17. It says he called the elders. And then it says in verse 28, pay careful attention to the flock, which means your shepherds. And then the word overseer is used in verse 28 as well. Elder, pastor, overseer. So elder, write this down. They were wise, godly teachers of the Jewish synagogues. Every synagogue had them. Most of the elders in the early church came out of the Jewish faith, out of the synagogues, and they stepped into the church and became elders. They were wise, godly teachers. The word in the Greek is presbyteros. Presbyteros, that sounds like presbyterian. We get a lot of church words, congr- uh, you know, denominational words based on styles of government from these Greek words. So elders were wise, godly teachers. And then write this down, shepherds. Spiritual leaders are shepherds. They are pastors who feed and protect the flock. Pastors who protect and feed the flock. Shepherds look after the flock of God. Here's a picture of pastors doing their thing. This is the idea of what spiritual leadership is all about. In the cold, out in the field, watching over the sheep, and sometimes that's what it feels like in the lower right to take care of God's people. (laughs) You just hold on for dear life, and you don't know which way they're going to turn. Shepherds watch over the flock. That is a picture of what spiritual leaders are. Write this down. Overseers. They are leaders who govern the church. Leaders who govern the, govern the church. The word episkopos in the Greek stands for a more of a Gentile Greek word for an overseer of a city, a director, a leader, a manager, a governor. So put them all together and they're interchangeable and you get wise, godly teachers who feed and protect the flock and leaders who govern the church. That's what spiritual leadership is all about. So so watch out why. Well, because God made you leaders, overseers of his people. Wow, they're the flock of God and I'm a shepherd of them. Wow, wow, what a trust. Number one, watch out. Number two, because God made you overseers of his people. Number three, because wolves are coming to devour them. Because wolves are coming to devour them. Now it gets real in verse 29. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you. Now, just to make this real, we decided to borrow a wolf from the Brookfield Zoo. Go ahead and open the door and let it in. Just kidding. But what would happen if we did? What would happen if a ravenous wolf ran in here right now? Well, the scenario I'm about to tell you is worse than that scenario. A physical wolf would be bad, but a wolf, spiritually speaking, is worse. So however you would react... If a hungry wolf ran in the room right now, double it for what I'm about to say. Wolves are coming to devour the flock. Here's a picture of a wolf. We'll just show you a picture. That's coming. May already be here. Wolves are religious people who know biblical truths, but but they are actually going to work to destroy God's people. Do they look like wolves? No. They don't come in here saying they're a wolf. Can't wait to destroy you. Nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Bill. I'm going to ruin your salvation. Nice to meet you. They don't say that because Satan himself masquerades as an angel of what? Light. So how do we spot a wolf? We'll write this down. Their teaching is twisted. Their teaching is twisted. Wolves, fierce wolves, will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves, verse 30, will arise men speaking twisted things. 
So this is what makes it hard. They went to Bible school sometimes. They know their Bible. Oh, they read through the Bible a lot. They can tell you Greek. They're articulate. They seem like elders, shepherds, overseers. Maybe they've been a pastor or they served on a board. They have some knowledge that impresses you and lures you in. But there's something fishy about their teaching. There's something twisted. This actually ties into the very nature of sin and evil. What is sin? What is evil? A lot of people have no clue about that. Or sinful people, evil people. There's a lot of good in sin. C.S. Lewis made the point that sin is a parasite. It has to take something good and then twist it because evil can't make anything on its own. So that's where you will miss it. If you don't understand how temptation works, okay, there's something good that you need, that you like, that you enjoy hearing. Then it's bait. Then it's bait. Then there's a disguise that makes you not see the danger. That's how wolves operate. But their teaching is twisted, and they ultimately add to or subtract from the Bible. Oh, it's bigger than what you heard growing up. I've got some new things you have never heard before. Oh, new things. I've never heard this stuff before. Watch out if you've been in your church, if you've been in church the whole life. Oh, I've heard it all. I've heard it all. Oh, there are some people who will teach you some new things if you have itching ears to listen to things beyond the Bible. Watch out if the Bible has become old news to you. You're a sitting duck. You don't need new things. The Bible is plenty to satisfy your soul forever. Watch out for people who show up with new teaching. Watch out for people who start subtracting things. Well, yeah, I mean, I know it says that, but come on. Do we really believe that still? Snip, 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 snip. You've got less of a Bible. Their teaching is twisted. Today, a lot of people are being misled by false teaching in the church. Some are tempted to chase after more supernatural things, more miracles, more healing, even someone who claims to have raised the dead. Beware. Beware someone who claims to have the apostle's authority. Watch out for people who teach today that sinful, worldly ways of life and thought are okay with God. When what the world is saying sounds a whole lot like what this teacher is saying, watch out because they're subtracting moral prohibitions from the scripture. Watch out for strange teachings about how you need to know the Jewish roots of your Bible or the original languages or strange teachings about church history. Watch out for strange teachings about manifestations of spirits and angels and special prayers that have been found. Watch out for strange teachings that suck you in. One guy who was teaching at our church at one point taught our students that words have magical power and studies have shown that if you speak to water in a certain tone that your voice can affect the energy in the molecular realm and that's where name it claim it teaching comes from and I sat down with him I'm like you can never teach that again because that's false do you think he said okay no he said I used to think that too but I saw some YouTube videos and blah 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 and an hour and a half later I said I'm rebuking you because you're teaching false things. The human voice does not have spiritual power to affect the physical realm or the spiritual realm. That's a false teaching. He wouldn't listen to me, so he left the church. We have to watch out for strange, twisted teachings that are not true. Their teaching is twisted. Write this down. Their disciples are deceived. Their disciples are deceived. And therefore, they're mistreated, manipulated. Sometimes these disciples are complicit because they're getting something out of the relationship. Sometimes they're not. They're blind. Sometimes they embrace the sin of a false teacher and look away from it. But other times, they're truly tricked into thinking this person is a legitimate teacher of God. It says, speaking twisted things, verse 30, to draw away the disciples after them. So they want their following. They want these people, and they're going to mistreat them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish every one of you with tears. 
So their disciples are deceived, and we've had people in our church who've reported crazy things going on in past churches from the pastors or the leaders. There was one church where the pastor was so addicted to medication that he used his flock to try and get his pain pills from them. What a predator! People can get twisted. When Y2K was coming about, I talked to somebody when we first launched our church. He said, yeah, I went to a cult church. I said, what do you mean? Well, I was asked to buy gold in my pastor's office to get ready for Y2K. Oh, did you leave? Yep, I left. Good job. And in churches like that, they teach you, watch out. If you leave this church, you've lost your covering of protection. We can't, we can't protect you anymore. So who knows what's going to happen to your family when you no longer have our protection. This is the kind of thing you have to watch out for. Write this down. Their hearts are impure. Their hearts are impure. This is how you spot a wolf. Their teaching is twisted. Their disciples are deceived. Their hearts are impure. Greedy for money. And Paul goes on to say, now I commend you, verse 32, to God, to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord. He's using his example to show you what a wolf isn't and their pattern to show you what a wolf is. Watch out. Their teaching is twisted, their disciples are deceived, their hearts are impure. In Acts 13.10, here's what he says. We'll put it up on the screen. He said, uh, this, is, this is actually looking back to a, a former encounter in the book of Acts with a false teacher. And said, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop, listen, making crooked the straight paths of the Lord. That is the condemnation that falls on any false teacher. Therefore... You have to watch out for them. So wolves are coming to devour them. Number one, watch out. Number two, because God made you overseers of his people. Number three, because wolves are coming to devour them. And then number four, write this down. So grow strong by teaching and applying God's word. Grow strong by teaching and applying God's word. What's the... (laughs) How do we get ready for this? Well, we grow strong. Leaders grow strong, and they grow strong sheep by teaching and applying God's word. It says in verse 32, Now I commend you to God, not to me, to God, and to the word of his grace, not my ideas, the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So write this down. Be sanctified and mature. Be sanctified and mature. A few ideas here describe what spiritual growth and integrity look like. He says in verse 32, to build you up. And then he says, sanctified. So the idea here is you are like a construction project that is built up with strong materials. Maybe you've done a renovation, maybe you've been a part of a project in the past where they didn't do the job right and they didn't use the right materials. And you know what it's like when, boom, the pipe bursts and you've got a water problem or zap, the power isn't working right because they didn't get the job done right or your roof leaks. I'm sure that you have some stories about construction or renovation projects that have gone wrong, am I right? Well, in a church where the leaders have failed or are failing or are false, they will not build correctly. They'll use faulty teaching, and therefore, there will be a collapse, and a lot of people will get hurt. So we have to build correctly using God's Word. The other idea here is sanctification. It says here to be um, sanctified, to be sanctified. That means to be washed, to be set apart in verse 32, sanctified, to be cleansed. So we're not dirty in our lifestyle or our language. We're not filthy in our mind, our thoughts. We're not greedy in our hearts. We're not filthy when it comes to sin as leaders or as people of God. We are actually washed, 
set apart, purified, and that's what maturity looks like. Instead of being filthy and poorly built. The picture here is leaders who have integrity. They're built strong by God's grace and God's word. They are cleansed of sin, pure like Paul, to take care of the flock of God. They are making disciples using God's word who are also strong, built with God's word, cleansed of sin. Then you've got a church that is glorious to behold. What a picture. Grow strong by teaching and applying God's word And remember it says God's word of grace. So his word of grace means there's a gentleness and a free giving from his spirit of all of this. It's not because we're working. It's not because we've earned it. It's because of the grace of God, the word of God, that the church of God is being built strong. Be sanctified and mature, established, cleansed, and built up. Write this down. Be generous and hardworking. Be generous and hardworking. He profiles two of his signature traits and commends them to the leaders to then teach them to the flock. Wolves, false teachers, are not generous. They're greedy. They're not hardworking. They're lazy, and they're preying on the sheep of God. So Paul's, the fact that he was sanctified, the fact that he was mature, focused on God's word, and now generous and hardworking shows he is a genuine leader, and he shows the kind of sheep that should be built. Be generous and hardworking. So how is your heart as a leader when it comes to being generous and hardworking? How is our heart as people of God when it comes to being generous and hardworking? Let's talk about generosity first. When it comes to giving, the idea of giving generously to the people of God and the kingdom of God is a theme that flows throughout the book of Acts. They were so generous to God and his kingdom, and the leaders set the pace. Barnabas was a leader who sold property and brought it to the apostles because the kingdom was expanding. They made tremendous sacrifices as leaders to show the people of God the value of the kingdom of God. How's your heart when it comes to giving generously to God? It begins when you understand the meaning of the word inheritance, It says here in verse 32, to give you the inheritance, the inheritance, which ties into Paul's 32, I coveted no one's silver or gold. The inheritance is the spiritual understanding that if you've become a child of God and you are a child of the Father, uh, that he has given you the kingdom. So, So you are set for eternal life. Because the Father has handed you streets of gold. You have been handed heaven free forever. And when you as a child of God realize that God has handed you heaven free forever, that reaches down into your pockets and makes you transformed And you want to hand other people heaven and help. So if you've grasped the generosity, the eternal generosity of God, you want to become like him in handing other people heaven and help. And that shows up in generous giving. The inheritance that prompts the freedom from coveting. In all things, I've shown you that by working hard in this way, verse 35, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus. Now, he quotes Jesus, but we don't have a record of this saying elsewhere, so Paul has a saying of Jesus here that's found only here. How he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, we, of course, have been taught the opposite of that from when we were young. It's better to get than to give. Am I right? Get all you can, while you can. So we live not to get, but to give as Jesus commands and commends. The Bible says that the blessed life comes to those who live to give, not those who live to get. Matthew 6, 19 to 21, we'll put that up on the screen. Here's what uh, Jesus said. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, 
where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So our heart follows our treasure. And if our treasure is on the let's get all we can and save it and keep it and store it and protect it, your heart will be hoarding and it will be on earthly things. But if you live to give to God's people and his kingdom work and you give sacrificially, generously, cheerfully, regularly, then your heart flows there and you are full of joy for God's kingdoms expanding throughout the earth. And you have a portfolio in heaven that Charles Schwab isn't looking after for you. God himself is watching over it. Be generous. How are you doing with generosity? It's a really good time to check to see where you're at with your giving. Maybe you're not giving yet and God is prompting you to become a generous giver to his kingdom work. Maybe you're not giving sacrificially yet and God is prompting you to give sacrificially. Maybe you are giving sacrificially and God is challenging you to press on. Some have the gift of giving and they have been prospered in a unique way for such a time as this to truly make a great gift to the kingdom work. Wherever you're at, let's give because God has handed us heaven freely and so we should give to help others find heaven as well. So be generous and finally hardworking. Hardworking. He says here, by working hard in this way we must help the weak And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. There was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again, and they accompanied him to the ship. Hard work, three years of hard kingdom work, Paul just finished. He was a tent maker, sweating out in the heat, you know, earning his own uh, way, giving, helping the weak, preaching the gospel over lunchtime. What a hard, hard worker. And how are we doing at God's kingdom work, serving his people, sacrificing our time and our energy to work hard for the kingdom? This is how the kingdom was built up back then, and this is how the kingdom is built up today, whether it's those who are showing up to cook the men's prayer breakfast, or serve at Awana Wednesday nights, or showing up to move mulch in the parking lot last week, or early this morning for tech team duty. This is working for Christ, and he's a king who deserves our very best. Well, number one, watch out. Number two, because God made you overseers of his people. Three, wolves are coming, and four, so grow strong by teaching and applying God's word. Well, based on this tearful goodbye, I think It's appropriate to close in prayer and to put all these things into practice as the Apostle Paul finishes up his third missionary journey. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and invite him to transform us by his word that we've heard today. Let's pray. Father, what an amazing section of scripture we've been in as Paul spent three years on the road, camped at Ephesus, camped at Corinth, going around teaching the gospel, souls getting saved, Lord, the power of miracles being done, the word of God being written on this trip. What an awesome display. And you did it through Paul, who was the chief opponent of the gospel, now living to get others to profess faith in Jesus Christ. So Lord, I pray that here as a church today, we would heed his call to beware. Lord, help us as a church to watch ourselves. I pray that you would help us right now to As the Bible says, test and see if you are in the faith. I wonder if there are some here today who have never believed on the Lord Jesus and been saved. They've never repented and asked you, Jesus, to wash them of all their sin by your blood. Right now, they can say it in their own heart. They can say, Jesus, free me from my sins. Jesus, thank you for dying for me on the cross. They could become the very people of God, the very presence of God, the very purchase of God right now. And Lord, for those of us who have the incredible honor of leading your people, help us to watch out, first on our own faith and doctrine, not being led astray by temptation. Lord, help us to watch those who you have entrusted to us to care for them. Lord, to bring gentle correction when needed, to 
build them up when they feel weak, to drive away those who could hurt them spiritually. Lord, help us to keep careful watch. Protect our church from wolves, Lord, wicked men and women who would bring false teaching or living into our church and mislead and misguide many people. Lord, turn our eyes away from them. <clears throat> we pray that you would protect us from them. And Lord, I thank you that you have built us over the last 14 years to be an incredibly generous congregation that works hard for you. Perhaps there are some today who want to become a part of that and join in the generosity and join in the hard work for your kingdom. We pray that you would sustain and give us great endurance as we give by faith and serve you tirelessly. Lord, it's all for your glory. As we close the third missionary journey, we thank you for the wonderful stories we've heard. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and continue to respond to the Lord in worship, you know, just like Isaiah did when he heard the Lord calling out to him. He said, here I am, Lord, send me. My Savior calling, take up your cross and follow me. Let my heart move in sweet surrender. Lord, it's my joy to say yes to you. Say
fitting song to conclude the third missionary journey. Our leaders are coming down front to pray with you, for you, for your loved ones. Don't miss this opportunity to be prayed for. Please join us in the gym for refreshments after the service. As you go, know you are loved. We'll see you again next week. God bless.